Hello everybody. Today we have with us Prune and uh, Martin with us and both of them are from ETH Zurich and we are going to discuss their paper uh, G-O-C-O-O-R which I like to call it GOCOR. Is, it, is that right? Yes, that's, that's okay. correct. Yep. So that stands for bringing globally optimized correspondence volumes into your neural network. And uh, when I, okay, I'll introduce both of them to you. Prune is a PhD student at Computer Vision Lab of ETH Zurich since May 2020. She received a Master of Science from ETH Zurich with honors in 2019. Her main research interests include image matching and alignment, particularly in the dense setting, self-supervised and unsupervised methods, and deep probabilistic methods. Martin is a group leader and lecturer at ETH Zurich, Switzerland. Martin received his PhD degree from Linköping University, Sweden in 2018. His PhD thesis was awarded the biennial Best Nordic Thesis Prize at SCIA 2019. His main uh, research interests include meta and online learning, deep probabilistic models and conditional generative models. Uh, also applications to visual tracking, video object segmentation, dense correspondence estimation, and super resolution. We are glad to host you today. Please go ahead with your talk. Great. Well, thank you very much. I will try sharing my screen. Let's see if so. Can you see now the, the screen? Okay, we'll get rid of this. Yes. Great. Okay, let me just try if, yeah, seems to be fine. Okay, well, so I will be presenting, uh, so I'm Prune, and I will be t presenting um, the talk. So um, it's our recent NeurIP 2020 um, GoCore, bringing globally optimized correspondence volumes into your neural network. Um, so thanks a lot for having us here, and also thanks for attending. Um, and so, as, as it was already said, uh, this day's joint work was uh, Martin Denelian, who is also here today, and uh, also with Luke Van Gool and Radu Timofte. And so, we're all from the Computer Vision Lab of ETH Zurich. Um, so, I think the easiest is I will just go through each section and ask if you have some questions, then, yeah, we can, we can discuss at that point, if that's fine. Um, okay, so, um, yeah. In, yeah, great. So um, in this work, we propose an alternative to the feature correlation layer. And uh, so the feature correlation layer evaluates a dense correspondence course between an image pair in the form of a correspondence volume. And um, so it actually has several names, this correspondence volume. I mean, in the literature, you have it as um, correlation volume or cost volume, but that all refers to the same thing. And so this feature correlation layer, it's really a fundamental um, block in a wide range of applications. I mean, you. you encountered it in, um, you encounter it as, um, in disparity estimation, in few shot segmentation, video object segmentation, and in different tasks of matching, such as geometric matching, optical flow, and semantic matching. But um, in our work, we really focused on the task of dense correspondence uh, matching. And so first I want to define what I mean by, by uh, dense correspondence estimation. So if you have this pair of query and reference images, um, you're trying to find pixel that share the same um, semantics and the same underlying structure. But this is actually sparse feature matching because you're only matching a couple of pixels. Whereas in the dense feature matching setting, you're really trying to find a match for every single pixel of the reference image. And so this is commonly done by estimating the flow field. Um, so it is two dimensional. It is two dimensional because there is the, the flow in the y and its x direction. And so either you estimate the flow like this, or you estimate the correspondence map that encodes absolute value, but the, the um, principle is the same. And so a common way to actually assess the quality of this flow is to varp the query according to that flow, and you're then hoping that the varp query will resemble the reference image. So. Um, then so the task of dense correspondences is uh, divided into different subtasks depending on the origin of the images. So the first one uh, is quite extensively studied and it's called optical flow. And in optical flow, so the image that you're trying to match are consecutive frames of a video. And so as you can see in this example here, therefore they have quite, um, quite small motions, but it can be very detailed. And usually the uh, appearance changes between the frames are quite small. And uh, on the other hand, 
another major subtask of um, dense matching is geometric matching. And there the images are different viewpoints of the same scene. And so as you can see here, um, the images then have like much, much larger uh, motion and also appearance changes. And so this specific task has been a bit less explored um, in the context of, of dense matching. Um, but however, so regardless of the specific task of optical flow and geometric matching, um, almost all matching networks share a similar architecture. And so I want to say a couple of words about this typical matching network architecture. Um, so once again, you start from your pair of images, the reference and the query. And then the first step is usually to extract um, dense descriptors, so uh, feature maps. Then the second step is to correlate those feature maps. And that's done with the feature correlation layer and it outputs um, this uh, correspondent volume, which encodes uh, correspondent scores. And finally, the last step is usually that uh, you have a flow decoder that takes as input this correspondence volume. I mean, of course, you can take other inputs and uh, it outputs the, um, the estimated flow field. And so here you already see how important this, this correspondence volume is because it will really determine the quality of the estimated flow and therefore of the end task. And so in multiple scale architecture, um, this sequence is also repeated at multiple levels. And to make it a bit more, a bit more practical, um, I show here um, a real like, yeah, um, a real architecture doing dense matching. So this is GUNAT. And um, so I won't go into too much detail now because I will talk about it again. But you just see that it's a multi-scale architecture. Uh, it has multiple levels. And at each level, you have um, a feature correlation layer followed by a decoder. So for example, here you have a global variant and a local variant. I will also explain the details a bit later. And um, so this uh, architecture estimates uh, the flow field at each level, uh, which I call W, um, Y, sorry. And so this network has a set of parameters uh, that I call theta. And so that's basically the decoder weights, uh, the feature backbone weights, and these need to be learned. And they are learned through minimizing this training loss. Um, so that's a fairly standard um, training loss for, um, for dense matching is just a regression between the estimated um, flow field and the ground truth flow field at different levels. And so we learn this weights in a very standard way by minimizing this loss with um, stochastic gradient descents. So yeah, that's a really like standard training procedure and loss used in, a, in most dense uh, matching architecture. And so once again, you see that the key architectural component is this feature correlation layer that outputs the correspondence volume. Um, but actually, even though so it's really important, um, the feature correlation layer has, has lots of limits and lots of drawbacks. And um, quite weirdly, there are not that many works that focus on improving, improving um, the quality of the estimated correspondence volume. And so in our work, that's what we want to do. So we propose um, GoCore, and that should be an alternative to the feature correlation layer. Um, and we really want it to be a plug-in solution. So we'll just replace the feature correlation layer, put in GoCore instead, but do not change the rest of the architecture. So you want most of the architecture to be fixed and also the training strategy, um, and you really just replace the feature correlation layer and um, improve the end task. So yeah, that's like the, the, the goal of this work, let's say. So now I want to give a bit more background about um, the feature correlation layer. How does it work and its different variants? So um, I know if you're aware, but the, the feature correlation layer, it evaluates pairwise similarities between two feature maps by taking the scalar products between the corresponding pairs of vectors. And so it has different variants, the local and the global. Um, so first looking at the local here, in the local correlation, the, um, the feature similarity is only evaluated in a neighborhood around each reference feature. So for example, if you have this um, mm. reference, yeah. Yeah, sorry to put in. Uh, so I had this question, like when we are talking about optical flow, we are basically measuring the vector displacement, right? Yes, yes, so it's, uh, it's a yeah, vector displacement, exactly. Yeah, so when you're talking about local feature and if we try to put it in the context of optical flow, how do you define it? Like the vector displacement of the nearby vectors, right? Sorry. Um, um, yeah. Shall I repeat again? Uh, no, no, no. No, so um, I mean in optical flow, so it's just the, the relative displacement, right, that, that's, that you want to estimate. But so in the, in the local correlation, for instance, you will have 
um, it already encodes some kind of relative displacements because for instance, I mean, if, if you see that your neighbor has a high correlation, it means that this one is the match and then you can get the relative displacement from there. I don't know if uh, that makes sense. Um, no, it, uh, um, okay, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, in this, in this uh, local correlation, so the, um, the local correlation at a position, so what I called AJ here, is actually the scalar product between the feature vector of the reference, uh, also at location AJ, um, correlated, so like the scalar products, between the query uh, vectors around, in this neighborhood, around location IJ. And so here, this neighborhood is defined by some radius R. But so here, we're really evaluating only in a neighborhood, which means that the local correlation only encodes displacements up to this, this radius R. It cannot handle any larger displacements because it's, it's just not correlated with, with these points. Um, and so usually the local correlation, it produces a 4D volume output, but um, because it's not very easy to process a 4D volume, usually it's uh, made into 3D by just concatenating the, last, uh, the two last dimensions. And so we result with a 3D volume, um, and this is the feature dimension. So now if I go to the global variant instead, um, in the um, global feature correlation layer, we evaluate the pairwise similarities between all query features and all reference features. So in a bit more details, again, um, the global correlation at the particular point, uh, AJ, IJ, you know, is just the scalar products between the reference feature vector at location AJ, but this time um, correlated with all, so every single one of the query feature vectors of the, the query map. And so once again, it should be a 4D volume, but it's all concatenated. And so that results in a 3D volume with dimensionality um, H by W, where H by W are the, 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 the feature size, sorry. And so the key difference here is, whereas the local can only hand, and handle small um, displacements, the global can theoretically estimate any kind of displacement. Okay, so um, that was a definition of the feature correlation layer, but it's a bit difficult in practice to visualize 4D or 3D volumes. And so that's why for the rest of the talk, I will look at slices of the correspondence volume. And these slices are um, created by correlating a specific point of the reference with the whole query. So for example, uh, in, the, in the global setting, I'm correlating that particular point of the reference with the entire query feature map. And that gives me this correlation output, which is basically a slice of the 4D correspondence volume. But here you can view it in 2D, so it's, it's much easier. And so for this, for example, this value here is just um, the scalar product between that point and that vector, or like that vector and that vector, and so on. So like this one is the scalar product between that vector and that vector. So it, it uh, becomes a bit more intuitive to, to see. And um, one last thing that could be useful is um, that this correspondence volume slice, uh, it can be seen as a confidence map. So for example, a high value here will indicate a high correlation value or a high confidence in the underlying match. Um, and so, yeah, so sometimes I call it a confidence map, um, confidence score, matching confidences that just, that all refer to the same thing. So it's just to prevent any ambiguities. And so we can have the same thing for the local um, correlation. So correlating that point with this neighborhood, you get this, this local correlation output. But um, since the principle and the limits and so on are the same for the local and the global variant, I will focus on the, um, the global feature correlation layer. But everything that I say can be transposed uh, directly for the local variant. Okay, um, maybe just any questions about the feature correlation layer up to here? Um, I guess none in the chat box. Okay, okay. there's a question. Okay, I'll ask. Uh, no, none. Please go ahead. Thanks. Okay, cool. Um, so now going back to then the global feature correlation layer. So here I correlated that specific point of the reference with the entire query feature map and I obtained this. And so now we want to observe a bit more what, what is happening there. And so we actually see that the feature correlation layer in that case 
it produces inaccurate confidence map because it has multiple high confidence values. And um, so this, this is not good because ideally we would like to have this um, correlation with so a single high confidence value at the location of the matching pixel and zero otherwise. And so uh, this inaccuracy of the correlation output is actually really annoying because as I said, um, the whole network kind of relies on this correspondence volume. And so it will have a really bad impact on the final end task. So in our case, in the estimated flow. So now we want to understand why, um, why the feature correlation layer is, is giving this inaccuracy. And um, so actually the reason for this inaccuracy is that each confidence value only relies on point to point feature comparisons. So for example, that, uh, that point here only relies from the scalar products between this vector and this vector. And um, this, uh, this only one by one comparison is actually insufficient to the Zambic weights when you have multiple regions with similar appearances, such as for example, those two. I mean, you see quite clearly here that those areas have um, similar appearances and also similar appearance than the point that you're trying to match. And that's where you have this ambiguous um, high confidence values. So, um, but now we also observe that these, um, these similar appearances regions, they're actually also present in the reference image. And um, therefore we wonder if we can use these extra information that are not used in the feature correlation layer to design a better module. Um, and so that will be go for it. Okay. Uh, yeah, hi, Prun. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hello. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. I have this question that uh, since we are applying convolution neural network on the image pair, so how mm -hmm. do you uh, find the correspondence between two patches, right? Because after applying the convolution neural network, we cannot refer them to as images, right? So you are showing on images, right? So you are showing the red patch on this image, right? Not on the output of the convolution. I guess, wasn't that heat map or something? So it should be heat map, right? So we cannot. So what exactly? I mean, here it's not convolutional uh, operations. It's only scalar products. So here it is scalar product, but on top of the image, we will apply the convolution operation. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how can we directly show the red patch on the image, right? So because each patch in the image will correspond to uh, multiple parts of the convolution. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you apply the convolution, that's how you get the, the feature map. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm fully getting what you mean, but if, if you mean that, of course, yeah, during test times, we, we don't know where the, the match should be, because I mean, the images are, are different, but um, that's just to explain the, um, to explain the reasoning, so. No, uh, Prun, like you have a reference feature map and then you have a query feature map. So how yeah. are you reducing the feature correlation layer out of it? Are you applying a CNN? And if you're applying a CNN, is it possible to get a heat map outcome of similarity? Is that right, Nikhil? That is the question. Yeah, okay, but yeah, so we're not correlating, sorry, we're not correlating uh, with a CNN, right? Here we just have the feature maps and the correlation is just done by feature, like um, scalar product, sorry. So there's no CNN here, it's just scalar products between two features. I see. Okay. Does it help, Nikhil? Yeah, yeah, got it. Sure. Right, go ahead, please. Yeah, so like this, this output here is, uh, is just coming from the scalar products between uh, this, this feature map and that feature map. So at that point, there's no, yeah, it's really just scalar product. And that's actually the, the issue because scalar products only consider one point here and one point here. And so it does not allow to disambiguate these multiple regions that result in these multiple high confidence values that are bad. Okay, so I hope this is a bit clear. Um, and so, yeah, a bit more formally. So in the, in the feature correlation layer, you extract um, reference feature map from the reference image uh, and query feature map from the query image. And um, so then these are correlated. And so this correlation, as I said, is just uh, scalar product operations. And uh, that allows you to obtain the final correspondence volume. And then this correlation volume is then passed to some decoder to output the final flow field. And so, I mean, this decoder is the one having like some, 
some neural network operations, but we don't, at that point, we don't really care about what's happened here. But so um, in GoCore instead, we replace the, um, the reference feature map by some tensor that we call the filter map W. And so this filter map is actually the output of, of GoCore. And then this filter map is the one being correlated with the query feature to obtain the final correspondence volume. And then this correspondence volume is passed as usual to the, to the decoder um, and so on. And so now the, the, the key question is how do we achieve this, this filter map W prime, uh, W star, sorry, um, so that we have a better correspondence volume. Um, so in general, we can consider W star to be the result of a differentiable function that we call so P and uh, it has as input the um, reference feature map and the query feature map and it has a set also of trainable parameters theta. Um, now what actually happens within this function, the filter predictor? Well, um, actually, so W results from um, minimizing the minimization of this uh, optimization loss, um, L, and this minimization is happening during the forward pass of the network. So it happens during both inference and training. So that's, that's something I really wanna make clear. Um, I wanna point out the difference between the training loss that I mentioned previously and our internal optimization loss. And so the training loss here, it takes as input the, um, the estimated flow field and um, that one allows to learn the network parameters. So like theta, that's during training. And so what I said before, the, the um, theta are just uh, learned by stochastic gradient descent, minimizing this training loss. But so that's offline and that only happens during training. And on the other hand, we have a uh, GoCore that outputs the filter map W star. And that one is the result of an internal optimization procedure that takes place within the deep neural network. And so the filter map is obtained by minimizing this objective L, L within the filter predictor. But so in, in, in contrast, this minimization takes place inline and um, online, sorry, and it takes place during the forward pass of the network. So that's both during inference and during training. So that, that's really a major difference that uh, I wanted to make clear. I hope, hope it's clear. And um, so during training, we have this internal optimization and we also have the um, the uh, training optimization. And so that, that is related to optimization meta learning with an inner and an outer loop optimization processes. So yeah, I hope that's clear. Um, so now we can focus more on how the GoCore module actually works and is designed. Um, is this clear? Or? Yes, it is. Cool, great. So um, just a little summary. Yes, yeah, so the filter map is the output of GoCore and it results from this internal optimization procedure minimizing L. So now the key question is how do we design this L? And so now I will focus on this for a big part of the, the presentation. And so as I said before, um, correlating that point of the reference with the query feature maps, that gives an inaccurate feature correlation output. I mean, I said before, it has multiple high confidence values, whereas ideally you, should, you only want one at the location of the matching pixel and zero otherwise. But um, during test time, I mean, you do not know where the matching pixel is, right? So you, you don't actually know how the ideal query correlation looks like. So during test time, you can't use this, this information. But um, you notice that most of the similar looking regions, such as these ones, and which are the regions that are ambiguous and creating this, this ambiguity here, well, actually, they're also present in the reference image. But in that case, if you correlate the reference with the reference itself, this is the uh, correlation output. And actually, this is also inaccurate. It also has multiple high confidence values. And uh, you notice that these confidence values, um, which are ambiguous, are at the same um, regions that in the query. It's except that in that case, so when you correlate the reference with the reference itself, you actually do know where the, the ground truth match is, because it should just be, well, itself. It should be like the Dirac function um, in 4D. And so in that case, you can use this information. And so that's what we do in our first loss, the reference loss. So we basically want to generate a filter map W so that W correlated with the reference feature map resembles this ideal correlation. And so we can translate this to a regression loss over which we can optimize W. So let me explain a bit more here. So this, this term here is just the um, correlation volume between um, 
our filter map W that we want to optimize and our reference feature map. And this is the uh, output that we hope to get and that we know because we're correlating the reference with the reference. So, so we can get this ground truth. And so what this loss is doing is just basically enforcing that uh, W correlated with um, the reference feature map. So all at the same location, the vector at the same location, that should be equal to one. And that corresponds to that point. Whereas um, W correlated with the reference feature map, but when the reference feature map vector is at a different location, well, that should all be zero because we are in these, these areas basically. And so with this constraint, we really aim at designing W so that it explicitly suppresses all of these ambiguous um, matching confidences in, in um, ambiguous regions that have similar appearances because we know that those are also present in the query image. So we hope that while optimizing on the reference loss, we will also get better correlation output when, when applying it on the query. Okay, so that's, that's the intuition of the ref reference loss. But um, in practice, we use a slightly more complicated uh, variant um, that I will uh, explain a bit, uh, a bit now to make it more robust. So imagining that during the Google Core optimization, you have, um, once again, so you're correlating that point uh, WIJ, so at location IJ, with the entire reference feature map. And so, yeah, again, so like this is the ideal correlation, uh, one at the location of the match and zero otherwise. Now let's look at specific cases. And first let's look at the, the case of uh, matching location pairs. So now you're correlating that point with that point and they're both at the same location. So hopefully the correlation output value should be one. So now if the estimated uh, correlation is superior to zero, um, that's almost, almost valid, right? It's almost correct. Like you want one, it's superior to zero. But so this, um, this linear regression loss will, will uh, just drive it to the correct value. So it will work fine. If you have instead um, an estimated correlation that is inferior to zero, that's really incorrect because you, you want that point to be equal to, to one. So, um, so that's pretty bad but still the loss will, um, will also act correctly and uh, penalize that, that point and make it equal to one. So in the case of a matching location pair, the loss is, is acting correctly. Uh, okay. Now, if you look at the case of non-matching location pair, so now instead you're correlating that point with um, a vector of the reference map that is at a different location. And so you can define this distance between IJ and KL. And so distance is superior to zero now. And therefore the correlation value between those two vectors should be zero because you're like in one of these areas. Um, so again, let's look at uh, possible values of the estimated cor correlation value. So if it's superior to zero, that's wrong because you, you're hoping to have zero, but still the loss will also penalize that point and just drive it to, to zero. But now, so the most interesting case is if the estimated correspondence is, um, correspondence value is negative. So actually then the loss will also penalize uh, quite a bit that point because it wants to be zero. But in practice, you don't want it to be penalized because you want that any um, negative or zero correlation value indicates a non-match. And so that's, that's quite important because if it penalizes that point, then um, that will have a bad impact on W and then our on the correspondence volume and then on the end task. So like everything is, is, is related in that aspect. So basically you really want the objective to be indifferent to cases when a non-matching pair generates a strong negative correlation outputs. And so to enforce this, we introduce um, separate penalization weights, so V plus and V minus for positive or negative correlation outputs. And so here I'm just introducing this, um, this scalar function, uh, sigma, that basically just maps the um, correlation um, value by V plus or V minus depending on, on the sign. And that gives me a new formulation of my reference loss where I just introduce here my sigma and my V plus and V minus, but otherwise it's the same. But then I just made it a nonlinear regression loss, which is, which is more robust to, to these, these type of case, cases. But uh, so now looking at this, you have a couple of questions. It's uh, how do we parameterize these weights V plus V minus? And also how do we learn the transition 
between what I called before, like a, a match location and a non-match location. Like how this is all related to the distance, but when do we say that one yeah, like is also uh, how this distance is being calculated? What is the metric being used for the distance? Uh, so it's just Euclidean distance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's just uh, yeah. And so yeah, so how do we? what do we set for like, this is a match location, this is not a match location, that's also like quite un undefined. And so we actually parameterize this weights uh, V plus and V minus as a function of this distance. So that I have here between IJ and KL. So the points um, of the W where I'm correlating and the point of the reference map, what I'm correlating to. And so these are just um, schematic plots of the behavior that both weights um, should have. And so if I go back to my previous explanation, so like V plus is the factor for a positive correlation value. And so in that case, it's actually always important um, to have, to, to, to have the, this term into the loss. Um, I mean, like I said, I had before, when I was looking at a matching location or a non-matching location, it was always important. So that's why the V plus is always put to one. But on the other hand, if we look at the V minus, so that's the negative fact, uh, the factor, sorry, for a negative correlation value. And um, so when I have that distance D uh, equal to zero, it means that I'm looking at, um, at the matching pair. And so in that case, I want the correlation to be, to be one, right? So if the correlation is negative, it's really bad. And so I want to penalize it. So I actually need this value to be, to be one. But if I'm going away from the match location, so if I'm here, for instance, um, I want my correlation value to be zero. And so if it's negative, as I said before, I don't want it to be penalized. And so that's why I'm putting this V1, uh, V minus, sorry, to, to, to zero at that point. Okay, but still here, we need to know exactly like where to put this transition, what is the slope of this, of this curve. And so instead of uh, fixing it uh, arbitrarily, you remember that GoCore is actually embedded into a neural network. And so that gives us the opportunity to just learn, learn the weights uh, V plus and V minus as network parameters. And so, I mean, this, these weights are just like any other weights of the, um, the network and they are uh, trained by um, minimizing the final training loss. So that's different from the optimization loss, right? Okay. And so to add more flexibility, we also learn actually the, the target confidence. So why we also have it as a network parameter. And so that gives us the final uh, formulation of my reference loss, where here I just, uh, it's the same thing before, but I just uh, make clear that V plus, V minus, and Y in that case are all um, network parameters. Um, now just a little animation showing you what actually uh, happens during the optimization. So when I optimize over this reference loss that I just defined. And um, so here you see that um, while I am um, I'm optimizing on this loss, the correlation with the reference, it gets better. Uh, you see, I mean, it gets cleaner, it's, it's quite obvious, but also the correlation with the query. And this is at the end, my, my my target, because I'm more inter I'm interested in, in correlating with the query. But you see that this one also gets cleaner and, and better. So that's it for the reference loss. Uh, any, any questions at that point? Um, there's a question in the chat that asks what kind of optimizer is being used here? Okay, well, I'm coming to that point, so <laughs> um, I will answer soon. Um, I guess anything? So. Okay, great. Hello, Prun. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, why why we are not applying the go core optimization on the source and target image rather why we are applying after convolution neural, after applying the convolution neural network so we can directly apply on image page right uh, yeah yeah so we are applying it on the the feature map so that's um, okay so you mean why not directly on the image and like on the feature map yeah um, I mean, that's how the, the, the correlation um, works. Like you, you just do the scalar product between the, the features. Um, so that's just our, the base that we use because the, the features are much more discriminative than just the image value. So you have much more information encoded there than just directly the um, like intensity of the image. Okay. Uh, so uh, Prun, I have a question here. Uh, like. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you you told me that uh, you are just making a correlations right uh, between a original image and uh, the after uh, multiplying the product like scalar products and uh, uh, correlations that were existing so i would like to know how you found uh, like changes in the accuracies and all how i how i found it how accurate is it it is that's a question uh, uh, the question the question is that uh, a uh, simple question like uh, is it any like uh, uh, like uh, the changes in accuracy like taking the images of uh, original image you are taking or or the image correlated image so what is the difference uh, of the accuracies like did you able to compare or not um so then not using a correlation and just uh, using the images directly for like the decoder okay Okay. So okay. no, is that is that your your question? Like, so like, what what do you mean by like correlate the images? Then like, you mean the correspondence volume, like the result uh, of the correlation, or? Okay. Uh, like uh, here, question is like, uh, you have a one image, uh, original image is there. Then you have done uh, a scalar product with the correlated heat map you have generated. Am I correct? I mean, so the heat map is the result of the correlation between this and this. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. here, uh, the heat map. So here, I would like to know if I will take the original image without doing all this procedure. So what is the changes? Like, did you compare like any comparison? Like, if I will take. Uh, okay, so like not using GoCore at all. You mean? I mean, if if I just take the original image here, that's not using GoCore. That's just a normal yeah. correlation value. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, then I'm, I'm also coming to this in the results, um, but already, I mean, you saw that even in this animation, right? Um, you see that, um, so actually like the first, the first step here, that's not even so original image, but the, um, then with the original image, that's even worse. So already you see that um, the, the, the correspondence volume with GoCore is, cleaner okay. than with original images. Okay. okay. But I'm coming with lots of results uh, after, so. But before that, there are lots of questions also in the chat section. Uh, okay. There's one from Nora, she is asking from where are we getting the filter W? So the filter W is um, the one that you're trying to optimize. So if I go back. Yeah, so um, W is the result of minimizing this, this loss L. So, um, I mean, I'm coming to, to how this optimization is done, but basically just a spoiler. Uh, so we try with an, with an initial value of uh, W and then we optimize using um, an iterative method. And then to like the final value, once we minimize this loss, um, this will be the filter map W. I hope that answers your question, Nora. Another one is from Anurag. Uh, he's asking the images in this setup are not pre-processed to introduce warping, right? Like no, that's no, no. Okay. No, so it's just like any any uh, pair of image that represent the same scene, but you know they can have lots of different viewpoints. So that's uh, just uh, yeah, just any any two pair of images that uh, are related to each other. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Anurag. Or you can unmute and go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, we can proceed. Great, so let me just go back there. Yeah, um, so, so far I've introduced uh, one first optimization loss uh, that I called the reference loss, and that was, so correlating the filter map with the reference feature map. And so we actually introduce a second uh, loss, and this one imposes uh, learnable smoothness priors on the correlation output, but so, so that's the loss. And um, here you see that the correlation is this time between, so the filter map and the query feature map. So that's different from before. Before we had the reference map, but I also mentioned before that the type of loss that we have for the reference, we can't use it for the query because for the query, we don't know where the, the ground truth match is. And so that's why we can't use it for the query. So here we have a different loss where you just basically apply some um, 4D kernel to this cor correspondence volume. And um, we actually learn this um, 4D kernel. So in the same way that V plus, V minus, and uh, Y that I had before, 
where uh, network parameters, we also say that R is a network parameter and it, so it is learned by, the, by minimizing the final training loss. And that's actually quite interesting because it means that during training, so through learning this R, you are actually learning what to learn um, for optimizing W because you're basically learning the value of this loss rate that you will apply to optimize W. So that's, um, that's quite an interesting, an interesting thing. But the intuition behind this loss was to impose some smoothness priors on the, the correspondence volume. And that's inspired by, uh, by optical flow. So in optical flow, um, like the classical framework of energy-based and also uh, the newest method, like in supervised deep learning, you have a lot of, they, they use a lot of, uh, of smoothness priors. I mean, for instance, in the unsupervised uh, deep learning, you usually have this loss where you, you enforce the gradient of the flow to be close to zero. That's, that's imposing smoothness priors. And so in the same way, if um, our R here was learning some uh, differentiate, differential operator, sorry, then that would have more or less the same effect of imposing that the gradient of this correspondence volume uh, will be close to zero. But here we're not looking at flows, but at correspondence volume, so it's slightly different. And also something quite cool is that uh, why in the classical method, so you have handcrafted, handcrafted regularizers, I mean, you say that it needs to be uh, gradient operators. Here instead, we completely learn R. So, so technically it could, it could learn some differential operators, but it could also not. So it's really free and flexible to learn whatever is helpful um, to optimize over W and then have a better um, estimated flow for the end task. So it really gives the flexibility to yeah, pretty much learn whatever uh, makes the correspondence volume better. Uh, okay, so that's all for the query loss. Then, so the final loss that we use for optimizing W is just, so the reference law that I had before, uh, the query law that I just uh, explained, and also we have some regularizer on the W. And just a little uh, recap. So my W prime is uh, the result of minimizing this, um, this loss here within the filter predictor. But uh, so now I'm coming to how do we actually perform this optimization? Because we also don't want it to be too long, right? Because it happens during the forward pass, so it doesn't seem to be that straightforward. Uh, but the key thing here is we actually don't need to find a global minimum. Um, we can only optimize up to a sufficient degree. And so that's why we use an um, iterative optimization method and particularly the steepest descent iteration. So how does it work? Um, for a current estimate of W, the steepest descent method, it finds the step length alpha that minimizes the objective, so L in the gradient direction. So here I'm just giving the formula. Um, but, um, and so we use um, a Gauss-Newton approximation of the loss. I mean, I don't have to go into details here, but you can check the paper where all the derivation are there but using this approximation that allows you to have a relatively simple closed form uh, formula for this alpha n. And so once you have this alpha, the um, update is just um, this, um, like this update equation. And so um, all expression can, can have a, well, like have closed form solutions and therefore we can use uh, standard neural network modules so that makes it quite efficient. And so in practice, we only use a couple of iterations, so three or five, which means that the, um, the runtime does not increase too much by adding GoCore. But I will also explain the runtime when I go to the results. Uh, so that's the optimization that we use. And because we use an iterative method, um, we also need to initialize the W to, to some value. And so that's what we do in the initialization module. Um, and so basically it's, uh, it's quite simple. We just want the W, so zero, that's the initial value at location AJ to be a linear composition between um, FR also at location AJ. So that's the reference map, right? And also um, all the other points of the reference map. So this bar means it's the mean over, over all the features of the reference map. And so then we have the same intuition than we had for the reference loss, which means that uh, w correlated with the reference or at the same location should be one and uh, w correlated with fr to like the mean of all other features that should be zero so yeah that's like really similar to the intuition that we had for the reference loss except that here um we just use the mean to have some 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 direct formulation 
Um, but so to add more flexibility, instead of fixing one and zero, we actually learn them also as network parameters. And so one can uh, easily solve this system of equation and so get the, uh, out the A and B here, and that gives you the initial value of the filter W. So once again, everything is in the paper for the derivation, but it didn't really make sense for me to go in there at that point. Um, yeah, so that's all for the function of Goku, and now we'll go to the results. So if there is any questions um, about this. Hello, Poon. Yep. Uh, Hi. C of your uh, correspondence uh, matrix, which is derived from FR and FQ, uh, will impact the theta parameters of the network, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so these correspondence values are again impacted by W. Yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, this correspondence value, yeah, okay, yeah. So W and theta are related, right? So network parameters and W are related. So how they are um, different? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, so W is, um, is obtained by minimizing. So if I go, yeah, to this one like W is obtained by minimizing this loss, but this loss actually depends on, on theta, which is the network parameter. So, um, yes. So in one of the slides, you mentioned that theta is trying using offline, uh, LTR is trying offline. Mm -hmm. So it should be online, right? Because they are dependent. Well, by offline, I just meant yeah, during training, but because um, once, I mean, so once the, um, the values of theta are trained, so during training, then they do not change anymore, right? So like, for instance, the R theta or the V, uh, V plus, V minus, that are all like uh, theta parameters, basically. So like after training, these do not change anymore. Um, they are, they're fixed, so like this loss after training is fixed, but the optimization over W, that happens always during the forward pass. But during, during testing, then uh, it will be fixed because uh, theta is fixed that, that has been trained already. Okay, okay, got it. Great. Anything, anything else? Uh, hi, Prune, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so this uh, query loss term, so is it like, uh, it is acting like a regularizer for the network? Uh, so not, not for the network, um, but we wanted to act as like a regularizer for the, um, for the, um, um, optimization of W. So we just like the, yeah, the intuition was just that it, this one, if it, if it learns some, uh, differential operators, then it will basically say that the gradient of the correspondence volume needs to be close to zero. And that enforces that, um, Basically, all of the correspondence values, they are smooth. Or can we think as better attention? Uh, can better we, sorry? Attention. Or can we better think attention. it as better attention in the network? I mean, for learning the uh, CW. Um, my, my doubt is uh, this, that for, uh, for this query loss term, when we are mm -hmm. uh, computing the C term, the correlation uh, matrix, will it be yeah. not too random? Um, why would it be, why would it be random? Uh, so, so, so the way I'm looking at it uh, is, uh, the reference loss term, it is essentially the autocorrelation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the query loss term, it is, uh, it is actually what we want to compute, but we cannot because we do not have the ground truth. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. initially this will be random. So how are we, I mean, how is this term contributing to, uh, you know, navigate the uh, loss mm -hmm. surface. Yeah. So I, I'm yeah. thinking that, is it not too uh, random? Yeah, so I, I, get, I get your point now. Um, so the thing is actually, so we are optimizing both losses uh, together. So uh, for instance, so yeah, this is, this is all together. So still uh, the W that, we, that is optimized through this loss is the same that is applied, that is applied to get this loss. So in that case, it won't be random because it also needs to fit um, the reference loss, which is, as you said, similar to like the autocorrelation. So if it was completely random, then that, that loss would also be, be completely failing, right? So like you need to, since it, the W also needs to fulfill the constraint coming from that loss, it needs to have this, this coherence. 
And also the second point is that we also initialize uh, the W to some value that, that already makes sense. So you don't initialize it randomly, you initialize to this value that uh, already makes sense. And so already um, correlating with the query will give you something more or less reasonable. Uh, one final doubt. Uh, in the query loss term, when we are modifying, I mean, learning uh, in the network, so that um, our theta parameter will be changing during training, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, how is it enforcing to uh, learn a better correlation? I mean, this term, how is it improving? CWFQ. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yes. the, yeah. network, the network will modify the R theta parameter, right? So yeah, how is it, exactly. how, how will it enforce this one? Yeah, so that's, I think, like a, quite a cool thing is that we, we actually don't, um, like by this loss, since R is, is learned, the only constraint that we're giving it through the training is that, so this R should be learning something so that, um, um, so this loss results in a formulation of W, like through the optimization, that will result in, so some correlation value such that the estimated flow field will be better and such that the training loss will be better. So it's, it's really like here, it's trying to, it's de designing a loss so that the resulting W will result in a final better end, um, end task, so end, um, end, um, end flow field in that case. So that's really like implicit supervision because you, you don't actually tell it like what, um, what um like what to learn you just tell it that you through what it is learning you want that the final um output of the network which is the flow is better so that the training loss you know starts being minimizing and since the final output the flow is dependent on the correlation that gives some implicit supervision for the w is this somehow clear or yeah okay uh, yeah that's clear thank you great Cool. Uh, anything else or continue? Okay. Mm, yes, please continue. Great. Okay. So um, then, so on to the um, integration of GoCo into different networks. So we integrated into two network, uh, PVCNet and GUNet. So first, uh, PVCNet. So this is just a, a small schematic of the um, of the network. So PVCNet is an architecture that is specialized in optical flow, and it has five pyramidal uh, levels each with a uh, feature local, uh, sorry, local, local feature correlation layer. And so to create a PVCNet Go core, we simply replace um, the um, feature correlation layer by our local Go core. And the rest of the architecture, I mean, here I didn't represent everything, right? I didn't put the decoder or anything. So it's really a simple, a simple plot. But so the rest of the architecture is, um, is left unchanged. And uh, we trained, so PVCNet Go core, as PVC net. And a bit more detail about this training. So actually we, we don't train from scratch here, but we, um, we use the pre-trained weights of like PVC net original. Uh, then we replace the feature correlation layer by GoCore, and then we continue fine tuning this. And so we fine tune first on uh, Things 3D, which is a very standard data set for optical flow. So it just has like lots of independently moving objects. So first we fine tune uh, on this data set. And then at the second stage, we also fine tune on Sintel, which is this animated um, movie. And um, so we, we have then PVCNet GoCore train on these two data sets and we can compare it to PVCNet original that we also um, continued fine tuning on these two data sets to be, to be completely fair. So that's PVCNet GoCore. Then we also integrate it into GluNet um, so GluNet is actually our previous work that was presented at CVPR 2020 as an oral. So I will just uh, be a bit more extensive on that one. And so uh, GluNet is applicable to uh, all tasks of uh, geometric match, uh, sorry, of um, dense matching. So it's applicable for geometric matching that has large viewpoint changes, but also for optical flow that is more small, uh, precise displacements. And finally, also to semantic matching. So this one I haven't really mentioned, um, it's uh, instead you're matching different instances of the same scene. So for instance, you're matching two horses, but there are different horses, but I have some example after. And so the way it works, it, um, so it's also a pyramidal network. It, it has two sub modules. 
that work at different image resolution. So you first have this, um, this LNet that works at fixed image resolution. And because it is fixed image resolution, it enables to have a, a global correlation layer. And so this global correlation layer will handle most of the very large displacements. Um, it is then the process to decoder and then refined by a local feature correlation layer. And then, so the output of uh, this network is passed uh, to the next network, which is the HNet. And so the HNet takes uh, original image resolution and um, it refines the flow with two extra um, local feature correlation uh, layers. Um, and so, so that's the standard GluNet. And to get GluNet GoCore, we also just replace the, um, the global correlation layer and the local correlation layer by respectively the global GoCore and the local GoCore. And uh, as I said before, so like all of the rest of the architecture stays the same and we train, so both GluNet and GluNet GoCore with the same procedure and on the same data set. So now on the data set, so as compared to PVCNet, so for GluNet, we train from scratch all the weights, except for the feature backbone that is fixed to, um, to VGD16 uh, pre-trained on ImageNet. And so we train on either the, what we call the static data set, which is just, um, so image pair that have some homography or some affine transformation. So they're like fairly simple transformations uh, such as those. Or we train on the dynamic data set, which is like the static data, plus we added some randomly moving objects. Um, and so this is useful because um, it allows the network to learn the presence of independently moving object and also motion boundaries which is particularly useful for optical flow and it is not present in the static data. And also like having this uh, randomly independently moving object that can be interpreted as both the camera and like some objects, like some people or something that are independently moving of each other. Um, yeah, so we train GluNet and GoCore on both those data sets and then we present um, the results. Um, so as of the training loss, so that I already, I already mentioned, we use this standard um, training loss and uh, it's trained end to end, there is supervision at all levels. And so that now I already mentioned through one of the questions, but it's just that the internal learner, it only receives implicit supervision from this loss because the output of GoCore, like W, that's not the, the, um, that's not the flow field, right? So, so like learning R for instance, um, that, that receives or like W receives implicit supervision from the final training loss. Okay, so now it's the ablation study. So to show the, the usefulness of our different uh, components and losses. And so to do the ablation study, we use a smaller version of GluNet. Um, so it just has a one global correlation and two uh, local correlations. And we evaluate on H matches. So that's a geometric matching data set. Um, it shows image pair related by homographies. And then we show results on Kitty um, 2012 and 2015. The two of them are really standard optical flow data sets. Um, yeah, the endpoint error is, um, um, yeah, the endpoint error. And so you want it to be as small as possible and PCK is the accuracy and you want it to be as high as possible. And so the first thing we can compare to is introducing our global go core instead of the global feature correlation layer. And so first we want to compare the impact of different optimization losses within the global goal core. And so the first one that we talked about was this linear regression where here nothing is learned. Um, and so you see that actually um, this linear regression, it does not particularly make it better. I mean, here the F1 is really, um, the F1 also it's um, the, the percentage of outliers. So you want it to be as full as possible. And so here you, you see that actually it gets worse. So like this is, this is not particularly helpful. But when instead we use our reference loss here, um, so that was defined here where V minus, V plus, and uh, Y are also network parameters, then you actually get a really, uh, a really big boost. Like for instance, input error, like from 30 to 26. Uh, the F1 also gets better. Like here you have 2%, so that's, that's quite substantial. Um, when you further introduce the query loss, so then you optimize over the sum of both and also, I mean, the regularizer is, is here, yeah. Um, that further increases the performance. Um, so like PCK here improves, endpoint error further improves. 
uh, F1 continues improving, like everything improves basically. So that's, that's a really, um, it's really working well. And finally, the last thing that we introduce is the local go core instead of the um, feature correlation, local feature correlation layer. And um, here, so that continues to improve um, the results a lot. And particularly in terms of accuracy, I mean, here you get like 7% more. Here also um, you get uh, like almost 4%. So that's, that's a really big improvement. Um, just one detail that I want to explain here, it's actually in the local GoCore variants, we only use um, our reference loss and not our query loss. And the reason for this is that the query loss, so since it applies this 4D kernel, it's uh, fairly computationally expensive. And that's okay on the global level because usually it's at, a, it's at a small resolution. But since the local correlation, they are usually at much higher resolution, having the query loss there it makes it quite slow and the uh, the gain was not much so at the end we decided not to have it on the local go core and only use the reference loss but as, as you can see already i mean only the reference loss gives like a huge boost so so it's enough um now a couple of examples uh, qualitatively so you have the um, query and the reference and here i'm showing so like the um, the varp query uh, that i'm tilting with the reference so it's easier to see and so you see that basically BaseNet is, is completely failing here. I mean, it does not manage to estimate the correct uh, transformation. So that's, that's the, like the pillar here. It's obviously, it's obviously wrong. Um, instead, when I put, uh, so global go core with only the reference loss, at least like it's not perfect, but at least it gets the, the like global transformation correct. Like the pillar here is, is correctly placed. Um, adding further the query loss. So here you don't really see much difference. But then finally adding our local go core that finishes to like really clean the, the flow and the, the final output is, uh, is much better. Um, another example, um, the query and the reference image. So here they really show some drastic appearance variations and you have this like weird light artifacts which are not easy for the network to to, um, to process. And so BaseNet, uh, you see that, yeah, I mean, on the background, it's, it's really failing. It's quite wobbly on the flies. Like it's not clearly, it's far from being perfect. Then introducing global go core with LR. So you still have this wobbly effect on the slide, but already like the background here uh, around this, this uh, pillar, that got better. Um, then further introducing the, um, the query loss that really smoothed um, the slide, like you have a lot less of this wavy effect. And finally, introducing our local go core um, made it uh, much, much better. Um, that's it for ablation study. Now on to experiments. So um, we evaluated go core on lots of different data sets and tasks. And uh, on each of those, um, go core leads to substantial improvement compared to the feature correlation layer. And that really shows the generalization capabilities of our module because it can, it can generalize to many different tasks and data sets. So I will go through each of those in a bit more detail now. Um, so the first data set is Megadepth. So that's a geometric matching data set. And this is a typical example of the images that you, you get there. So uh, you see it's like really big appearance variations and really big uh, geometric variations. So those are like particularly difficult examples that, that you could get. And uh, here we look at the accuracy, so like the PCK for different thresholds and comparing to original GluNet with GluNet GoCore, it's uh, super obvious that GluNet GoCore is outperforming GluNet by like a really big margin, especially for this, uh, this small threshold. So um, here GoCore is like really, really helping in this case of really large, uh, really large displacements. And these are the, um, the VARP query according to the flow uh, estimated by GluNet or GluNet GoCore. And uh, once again, here it's fairly obvious to see that uh, GluNet GoCore is much better. I mean, for instance, here, like it gets this, this large scaling, um, whereas GluNet original didn't. Yeah, here you have much more, much more um, correct VARPing and so on. So, uh, yeah. uh, can mm -hmm. you please point out again the difference between global and lo uh, local GoCore? Okay, yeah. Um, so GoCore, I mean, the, um, so like GoCore module is the same, it's just um, the local and global difference is the same in the feature correlation layer. So it's, um, it's the, the, um, the region 
that you look at what you're, when you're matching two images. So in the, in the global case, for instance, if you're matching to like one point of the reference, you're matching to the entire query feature map. So like to every single point of the query feature map. Whereas in the local variant, you're matching that point to only a neighborhood of the query feature map. And that neighborhood is gonna be centered at the location of the, of the reference feature and it will have a radius R. Is this, would you want me to go back to the early slides? Yeah, for me, yes. So Anurag asked and since he doesn't follow up the doubt, so I guess he got it. Yeah, he got it. Okay, uh, so he got it. Okay. Yes. So I can continue? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Great. So the second data set is H matches. That's also a quite standard uh, geometric matching data set. And here you have um, the images are related by some homography transformation. And once again, so we compare it to GluNet and DGCNet. So that's another uh, network doing dense matching. And uh, once again, our GluNet Go Core is um, much better than uh, GluNet or DGCNet. Um, then, so the last data set for geometric matching that I use is ETH3D. And so ETH3D, what you get is a sequence of um, consecutive frames. And so I sample uh, pairs at different intervals, which means that the, when the interval gets larger, then the, um, the motion between the frames also gets larger. So here you have like increasingly large viewpoints between the frames. And I'm looking at endpoint error and PCK, so as usual, between DGCNet and GluNet and GluNet GoCore. And uh, so once again, uh, GluNet GoCore here is, um, is much better for all intervals. So for increasing in large viewpoint changes, also the PCK is higher. And one interesting comment that we can make here is that the difference, um, like the relative difference between, for instance, GluNet and GluNet GoCore, it improves so that it gets larger um, when you increase the interval between the image frame. So that means that GoCore particularly is helpful in case of large, uh, large viewpoint changes. Uh, then a couple of qualitative examples again. So you have the query and the reference. This is GluNet and this is GluNet GoCore. And uh, for instance, in this example, you see that we get the like the head of the statue like better. This one is less wobbly compared to this one. Also for the slide, also for the how uh, for the doors. So yeah, in general, they just show that uh, GoCore is handling um, different appearance and uh, viewpoint changes much better. Uh, finally, up to the optical flow results. So this is Kitty, and I'm only showing the results on Kitty 2015. So this is this kind of images. Um, here I'm showing the difference between GluNet and GluNet GoCore. So this is not directly fully, fully relevant because it's not really trained on optical flow data. But still, on their data, we see that um, GluNet GoCore brings a really big improvement here in F1. Um, and now looking at PVC nets, so PVCNet GoCore compared to, so that's from the paper and that's the version that we train ourselves. Um, we see that again, so we have also a big improvement of like 2% in F1. And uh, finally, one interesting insight that we have here is when we train, so PVCNet and PVCNet GoCore on Sintel, which is this animated data, so it's really different from Kitty. Um, we see that the relative improvement from GoCore is much higher than, than uh, from, PVCNet like feature correlation layer. And that means that our GoCore helps the domain generalization. So particularly if it's trained on really different data, it will perform better because we have this, this optimization uh, that is taking place during the fourth place. So yeah, it can generalize better to like unseen data or unseen motion. So that's, uh, that's quite cool. Um, then, so you have Sintel, that's another optical flow data uh, data set. And so here the trend is the same, so I will not go into too much details, but GoCore gets better for old metrics and uh, the same for PVC nets. Okay, and one final uh, extension is this semantic matching um, setting where instead of um, matching images of the same scene, you match different instances of the same objects. So for instance, those two horses or like those two cars but you see that the background is very different and is not the same object. So it's, it's not directly, um, like we did not design GoCore exactly for this type of task, but we show that it can actually generalize to this, this type of, um, of images. 
and actually we also outperform so original GluNet and also this semantic GluNet um, that is a specific version of GluNet specifically designed for these type of images. And yeah, so we outperform all of those. Um, then, so about the impact of the number of iterations. Um, so for all network, I trained with uh, three iteration in the global and in the local uh, Go course. And we see so that um, the best for the global Go core, which is in green here, is always to have the same number of training iterations. So like three is the same than what I use during training. And the reason for this is that I use the, this query loss that has this, this kernel um, R, R theta. And so R theta, since it is learned during, during training, it actually learns a value that is optimal only when using three iterations. And um, on the other hand, for the local Go core, since I only use there the reference loss, uh, more iteration is just making the filter map more and more discriminative. So in that case, you see the same train for Kitty and for eight patches, uh, more iterations results in better performance. Um, here it's also visible uh, qualitatively. I mean, that's the output of, a, of a original GluNet and then increasing, increasingly increasing the number of iterations, it gets uh, better and better. Like particularly here, the motion boundary is, is much more clear than for original GluNets. Um, one last important, um, important comment is the runtime. So, of course, the runtime depends on the number of uh, iteration that you choose. So these are the runtime for original GluNet and original PVC nets. Then, so using three um, iteration, I get to this value. So, of course, there is a, a, a um, it gets longer, but we believe that uh, compared to the, to the um, improvement in performance that GoCore brings, um, it's still reasonable. And also, um, I mean, so in the paper, of course, we showed this, um, the results was um, the best we could get. So like with seven um, optimization iterations, but in practice, if you wanted to use it and not increase the runtime um, too much, you could also just choose to have only one uh, optimization iteration. In the paper, we show that even already with only one optimization iteration, the, um, the results of the final network is better than when using the feature correlation layer. So here you're fairly free to choose whatever suits you depending on your uh, performance and like runtime uh, balance that, that you want. Okay, so to conclude, um, in this work propose GoCore, which is a neural network module for predicting uh, globally optimized matching confidences between two deep feature maps. And so it acts as a direct replacement to the feature correlation layer. And so we, um, we formulate an objective function that integrates um, unexploited information about the reference and the query frames. And um, so we, um, we solve an internal optimization um, uh, task within the deep neural network. And so when integrated into state-of-the-art networks, so GluNet and PVZNet, GoCore significantly outperforms the feature correlation layer. So now a couple of future work that I just wanted to point out. Um, so first of all, the first one is that GoCore is a generic component. So theoretically it could be used in any um, task or network that benefits or uses feature correlation layer. And so one, uh, one important future work would be to extend it to other tasks, um, like tasks other than the, um, correspondence matching. So maybe in um, video analysis and, and so on. The second thing would be to, um, to explore different optimization losses. I mean, we also looked at um, imposing some uniqueness of matches or like some other losses, but yeah, um, some, some exploration of other losses that could be possible here would be interesting. And finally, um, a major future work, but that's more in the general uh, dense uh, matching task, is to find a way to identify um, accurate and inaccurate matches out of the dense flow field. And so I will actually say a couple of words about this because uh, we explored it in our recent work, um, PDCNet. And so for example, when you have this query and this reference, so like this is the estimated flow field, uh, the VARP query. And it's quite obvious that in some area it's working well, so like this is working well, but in some others, like this whole background and like the scale, the flow is completely failing. But at the moment, I have like no way to choose which correspondences is, is good or which is not. And that's, um, 
that's annoying because in lots of applications such as pose estimation or 3D reconstruction and so on, you actually really need a set of like accurate matches. So you need a way to select them out of this flow field. That's why we need to know like when and where to trust the estimated correspondences. So instead of only outputting the flow field, we also want to output a confidence measure to, to identify where we can trust the flow. And so little spoiler, um, that's what we do in our recent work. So learning accurate dense correspondences and when to trust them. Um, so we propose PDCNet um, that, that learns jointly a dense flow and uncertainty estimation and it's applicable even for extreme appearance and viewpoint changes. So if you're interested, um, yeah, have a look at this. All right, so that's all for my part. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, we will take uh, any further questions that there is, no? Um, so it was a like it was a paper with lots of contributions. I am wondering how much time it would have taken you to, you know, finish it from scratch to end. Like to do the whole paper. Yeah, like coming up with um, the idea and finishing it with the experiments. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean this one was um relatively fast. Um just because also it was a confinement period, right? So there was a corona period, so there was nothing else to do that working at that point. And also, so like, it's it kind of a follow-up um, on previous work that Martin had already done on tracking. So we didn't start from scratch. So the whole thing took a couple of months, but clearly the last uh, like month or month and a half was fairly dense in terms of a uh, of work that we did. Like so many experiments, I'm just like, how do we decide that? Okay, this is this much experiment is enough experiment. How would how do we decide that in research? Um, well, yeah, it's never enough, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, I think in this work we had very comprehensive experiments. So maybe mm -hmm. here we are doing more more experiments than it's usually. Uh, necessary and, uh, and and so on, but but we wanted to show with really comprehensive experiments that this really works and it's, it's a general applicable components and so on, which uh, which uh, we hope we we conveyed. And I mean, related to to the time and so on, this is of course a good question, especially when when starting out uh, as a PhD. And and what Prun indicated on, I mean, it's it's about using also the time efficiently and so on. So here during the Previous work that Prona done during her master thesis, this glue net, she had set up all the sort of basis data sets and and, mm -hmm. and the baselines and and so on. So it's when one has a good framework set up, then one can explore new exciting ideas and and be able to implement them and experimentally verify them pretty efficiently. I see. Like, I really loved the paper because throughout the paper, I was just thinking that if I am to do a workshop paper, how can I apply this one? And in which field, like anomaly detection, yeah, it would go video analysis, yes. Uh, like next frame prediction, yes, I can. Yeah, so the paper was like really nice. Like it is a paper on which so many new papers and application papers can be, you know, based on. So yeah, congratulations, great paper, I enjoyed it. Uh, so yeah, Thank one very basic question, mm -hmm. like because uh, this is uh, this is a new thing to me, and I read uh, this in your research interest, Martin. What is actually online and offline learning? Like, why are you using mm. both of them combined in one model? What is the benefit of you know combining both of them? And what like how do you specify like for this thing, offline is going to work for that for that online you could opt like how? Yeah, this is very good and, and uh, general question actually. So, I mean, if we zoom out, out a bit and look at th things from a larger perspective, I mean, many of, of um, applications in vision, especially where you achieve lots of early success in, in computation, like image classification or semantic segmentation, or for instance, this kind of forward, just feed forward convolutional neural network architectures had worked very well for those kind of tasks where you just feed in an image, you just apply your convolutional filters and, and you can do end-to-end -end training in a, in a very effective way. But there are many other types of problems where you need in the network to do some more complicated reasoning. And as Pran mentioned here, um, the, the, this is one sort of application that also has some relation to things like Meta learning and some general directions like that. So in this case, for instance, um, 
I mean, you're given two images, right? And from these two images, there are lots of quite complicated constraints and information you want to deduce. For example, I have one pixel in, in one image, and this I know can only match to at most one pixel in another image. And I know it should be a unique match and so on. So all these constraints and priors are quite difficult to utilize by just, I mean, we cannot only just concatenate the two images and feed it into CNN and this will give us the full flow field. So here we need to define some uh, neural network modules that can do some more complicated reasoning like that. And here this online optimization and online learning comes in in a quite nice, neat way. So we can, uh, through these losses that Prune talked about, design very eff effectively constraints and and uh, and utilize this prior information like we have this core loss that can afford some smoothness constraints and so on on the output correspondence volume and so on so uh, and and this matching loss that that allows us to get the more discriminative uh, confidence output so this kind of task appear in in for example tracking which is quite related field in few shots um, learning problems like few shot classification, few shot image uh, object detection, and, and things like this, for example. So, where we basically need to do some more complex reasoning uh, with our inputs. Um, so yeah, one another, a general question would be like, how did you ended up choosing this domain to work in? Um, yeah, so I don't want to disappoint you, but it was kind of random. Um, so, I mean, I, I, uh, I, did my, uh, I did my master's and um, so I did this class, uh, this computer vision class, and I, I, I really liked it. So then I did an internship but actually the subject was given to me and it was already about matching, but this time in the sparse setting and on medical data. And then, so I did my master's thesis and uh, so I discussed different subjects. Mm -hmm. And um, so the dense matching just seemed to be the one where I already had a bit of experience and the most promising in terms of um, result that I could get and also, um, um, like research wise that um, some improvement there can lead to really, really big improvement in lots of different uh, subjects. So that's, that was quite interesting. So I went for this and then it was just natural to continue on this for my PhD. So <laughs> it really was just uh, going with the, with the flow. Yeah. Like I, like I, I, at no point did I really decide like, okay, I want to do only like matching, but since I started with this, it just kind of all the way continued and, um, and each time you want to, on the one hand, build up on the thing that you already did, because of course it will be faster. And uh, as Martin said, I already had the setup and everything, but still want to explore different areas or, or... but that's why, I mean, now I, I also uh, probably will explore something a bit different from the dense matching setting, but um, yeah. I see. That's very natural. Most of us, like uh, so many people I've talked to and every, everyone has a similar kind of story that we ended up because the supervisor was in the field. Yeah. So <laughs> we got into it. Yeah. So <laughs> that's natural, I guess. Really. Yeah. I mean, it was really uh, just a natural continuation. So mm, I see. I see. Right. Hello? And you were like motivated uh, uh, to, yeah, please go ahead, Nikhil. Yeah. We have a question from the audience. One last question. So would it be valid to say the output vectors of Goka in a network can be passed under a LSTM network to develop understanding, prediction, or classification of temporal data? I mean, can we use this uh, correlation yeah. output from the image pairs? So, so as, um, shall I answer like that? Like a kind of question, like you're using a con mm -hmm. LSTM kind of a thing, and instead of using like, uh, you can we use Gokor as a feature vector for this? Yeah, I, th I think it could, because as we need to do, I mean, first of all, image matching is a, like, it's a very general thing and, and any kind of video analysis, often you want to sort of track or, or find correspondences between frames and so on. So it's applicable very 
generally in different kind of video understanding tasks and so on. So definitely the, the kind of dense matching you get, you could give to another component to do some something else, for example, into an LSTM network. What I think would suit better than in an LSTM network uh, is to apply some attention modules on it. So self-attention, cross-attention, or like a transformer network, because what happens here is that we, we are, and so, so this uh, confidence map or this GoCore uh, correspondences that we are outputting from uh, from this module is, if you think of it, quite similar to the key key value matching that happens in, in self-attention. So essentially you can plug it in in a quite nice way in those kind of networks. So if uh, you want to explore employing it there, I would probably use some kind of uh, spatial temporal attention instead of LSTM in that case. Right, a spatial temporal method would work better for video analysis based tasks. Mm. Um, yeah, so Nora in the chat appreciates the paper. She says it's, it is going to be really helpful in her work and your work is great as well, yeah. Right, so uh, is the code open source? I guess uh, I was trying um, to find yeah. Yeah, so it should be. It's just um, we had some issues getting like legal authorization to release it. But uh, as soon as we have it, we should release it. So that's the, uh, yeah, that's uh, ongoing. But hopefully it would, should yeah. be able to be out soon. Right, right. So um, any other questions from anyone? I can stop recording if everyone's done. So I have a question like, uh, uh, just uh, I would like to thank uh, the paper was really, uh, you know, uh, it was so meaningful. And uh, the question is that, uh, have you taken any references, references? Uh, like uh, where you get to idea go correlations and all, how get stuck and all these problems. Any references, can you tell me? Uh, paper references or any references where you get the ideas to do mm -hmm. the things. Um, Do you mean the, the references to where we got this idea of the Goker module itself? Yeah, exactly. Like it is taken from any anywhere or it's a origin. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, I mean, we, we have a short discussion in the related work about the the relations to to meta learning and I mean. One, I mean, the, the ideas from, from here come from a different part, but one of the sort of base um, source of where this idea come from is, is from that direction. So I've been working on, on some meta-learning ideas for, for visual tracking and so on. And, and from that point, this was quite kind of a, a natural extension applying this in a, in a dense fashion. And then that was combined with ideas during Prune's math thesis, how we developed and she developed um, the architectures for for geometric matching. So we have some works that are are cited in related work that were kind of influential in in developing these ideas of having such an optimization based uh, module inside a neural network. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. I Marty. hope that answers you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so I guess that's all for today. Uh, we like it was great hosting you with us and discussing the paper. A really, a paper that would that really needed a great amount of discussion with all the mathematical mm -hmm. concepts it had and the equation and all. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for being a part today, and we look forward to great work from both of you in future. And uh, yeah, like I will surely be looking forward to more such work, which can be, you know, derived into other works. Mm, okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for having us. Uh, it was great to have the opportunity to talk about this work and have feedback. So that's great. Thank you, Prune and Dr. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Incredible work. It kept surprising us multiple times. I mean, different components are there and it's surprising us multiple times. Yeah. yeah.
Yes, I hope uh, you enjoyed it. And, presentation. Yeah. And if you have any additional questions or anything, feel free to contact us as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you.